The Procession of Simulacra The simulacrum is never what hides the truth. It is truth that hides the fact that there is none. The simulacrum is true. Ecclesiastes. If once we were able to view the Bourget fable in which the cartographers of the empire drew up a map so detailed that it ends up covering the territory exactly, the decline of the empire witnesses the fraying of this map, little by little and it's fallen to ruins, though some shreds are still discernible in the deserts, the metaphysical beauty of this ruined abstraction testifying to a pride equal to the empire and rotting like a carcass, returning to the substance of the soil, a bit as the double ends by being confused with the real through aging. As the most beautiful allegory of simulation, this fable has now come full circle for us and possesses nothing but the discreet charm of second orders, simulacra. Today, abstraction is no longer that of the map, the double, the mirror, or the concept. Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyperreal. The territory no longer precedes the map, nor does it survive it. It is nevertheless the map that precedes the territory, precession of simulacra, that engenders the territory, and if one must return to the fable, today it is the territory whose shreds slowly rot across the extent of the map. It is the real and not the map whose vestiges persist here and there in the deserts that are no longer those of the empire but ours, the desert of the real itself. In fact, even inverted, Bourget's fable is unusable. Only the allegory of the empire perhaps remains. Because it is with this same imperialism that present-day simulators attempt to make the real, all of the real, coincide with their models of simulation. But it is no longer a question of either maps or territories. Something has disappeared. The sovereign difference between one and the other that constituted the charm of abstraction. Because it is difference that constitutes the poetry of the map and the charm of the territory, the magic of the concept and the charm of the real. This imaginary of representation, which simultaneously culminates in and is engulfed by the cartographer's mad project of the ideal coextensivity of map and territory, disappears in the simulation whose operation is nuclear and genetic, no longer at all specular or discursive. It is all of metaphysics that is lost. No more mirror of being and appearances, of the real and its concept. No more imaginary coextensivity. It is the genetic miniaturization that is the dimension of simulation. The real is produced from miniaturized cells, matrices, and memory banks, models of control, and it can be reproduced an infinite number of times from these. It no longer needs to be rational, because it no longer measures itself against either an ideal or negative instance. It is no longer anything but operational. In fact, it is no longer really the real, because no imaginary envelops it any more. It is a hyperreal, produced from a radiating synthesis of combinatory models in a hyperspace without atmosphere. By crossing into a space whose curvature is no longer that of the real, nor that of truth, the era, era of simulation is inaugurated by a liquidation of all referentials. Worse, with their artificial resurrection in the system of signs, a material more malleable than meaning, in that it lends itself to all systems of equivalences, to all binary oppositions, to all combinatory, combinatory algebra. It is no longer a question of imitation, nor duplication, nor even parity. It is a question of substituting the signs of the real for the real, that is to say, of an operation of deterring every real process via its operational double, a programmatic, metastable, perfectly descriptive machine that offers all the signs of the real and short-circuits all its vicissitudes. Never again will the real have the chance to produce itself. Such is the vital function of the model in a system of death, or rather of anticipated resurrection, that no longer even gives the event of death a chance. A hyperreal henceforth, sheltered from the imaginary, and from any distinction between the real and the imaginary, leaving room only for the orbital, orbital recurrence of models and for the simulated generation of differences. The Divine, divine Irreference of Images To dissimulate is to pretend not to have what one has.
To simulate is to feign to have what one doesn't have. One implies a presence, the other an absence. But it is more complicated than that, because simulating is not pretending. Whoever fakes an illness can simply stay in bed and make everyone believe he is ill. Whoever simulates an illness produces in himself some of the symptoms. Beautre. Therefore, pretending or dissimulating leaves the principle of reality intact. The difference is always clear. It is simply masked, whereas simulation threatens the difference between the true and the false, the real and the imaginary. Is the simulator sick or not, given that he produces true symptoms? Objectively, one cannot treat him as either being ill or not ill. Psychology and medicine stop at this point, forestalled by the illness's henceforth undiscoverable truth. For if any symptom can be produced, and can no longer be taken as a fact of nature, then every illness can be dis considered as simulatable and simulated, and medicine loses its meaning, since it only knows how to treat real illnesses according to their objective causes. Psychosomatics evolves in a dubious manner at the border of the principle of illness. As to psychoanalysis, it transfers the symptom of the organic order to the unconscious order. The latter is new and taken for real, more real than the other. But why would simulation be at the gates of the unconscious? Why couldn't the work of the unconscious be produced in the same way as any old symptom of classical medicine? Dreams already are. Certainly, the psychiatrist purports that, for every form of mental alienation, there is a particular order in the succession of symptoms of which the simulator is ignorant and in the absence of which the psychiatrist would not be deceived. This, which dates from 1865, in order to safeguard the principle of a truth at all costs and to escape the interrogation posed by simulation, the knowledge that truth, reference, objective cause have ceased to exist. Now, what medicine what can medicine do with what floats on either side of illness, on either side of health, with the duplication of illness in a discourse that is no longer either true or false? What can psychoanalysis do with the duplication of the discourse of the unconscious in the discourse of simulation that can never again be unmasked, since it is not false either? What can the army do about simulators? Traditionally, it unmasks them and pu punishes them according to a clear principle of identification. Today, it can discharge a very good simulator as exactly equivalent to a real homosexual, a heart patient, or a madman. Even military psychology draws back from Cartesian certainties and hesitates to make the distinction between true and false, between the produced and the authentic symptom. If he is this good at acting crazy, it is because he is. Nor is military psychology mistaken in this regard. In this sense, all crazy people simulate, and this lack of distinction is the worst kind of subversion. It is against this lack of distinction that classical reason armed itself in all its categories. But it is what today again outflanks them, submerging the principle of truth. Beyond medicine and the army, favored terrains of simulation, the question returns to religion and the simulacrum, sim simulacrum of divinity. I forbade that there be any sim simul simulacra in the temples, because the divinity that animates nature can never be represented. Indeed, it can be. But what becomes of divinity when it reveals itself in icons, when it is multiplied by simulacra? Does it remain the supreme power, or is it simply incarnated in images as a visible theology? Or does it violate itself in the simulacra, that alone deploy their power and the pomp of fascination, the visible machinery of icons substituted for the pure and intelligible idea of God? This is precisely what was feared by iconclasts, whose millennial quarrel is still with us today. This is precisely because they predicted this omnipotence of simulacra, the faculty simulacra having of a faced God from the conscience of man, and the destructive, annihilating truth that they allowed to appear, that deep down God never existed, that only the simulacrum ever existed, even that God himself was never anything but his own simulacrum, from this came their urge to destroy the images. If they could have believed that these images only obfuscated or masked the platonic idea of God, there would be no reason to destroy them. One can live with the idea of distorted truth, 
but their metaphysical despair came from the idea that the image didn't conceal anything at all, and that these images were in essence not images, such as an original model would have made them, but perfect simulacra, forever radiant with their own fascination. Thus this death of the divine referential must be exorcised at all costs. One can see that the iconoclasts, iconoclasts, whom one accuses of disdaining and negating images, were those who accorded them their true value, in contrast to the iconolators, who only saw reflections in them and were content to venerate a filigree god. On the other hand, one can say that the icon worshippers were the most modern minds, the most adventurous, because, in the guise of having God become apparent in the mirror of images, they were already enacting his death and his disappearance in the epiphany of his representations which, perhaps, they already knew no longer represented anything, that they were purely a game, but that it was therein, the great, therein that the great game lay, knowing also that it is dangerous to unmask images, since they dissimulate the fact that there is nothing behind them. This was the approach of the Jesuits, who founded their politics on the virtual disappearance of God, and on the worldly and spectacular manipulation of consciences, the evanescence of God in the epiphany of power, the end of transcendence, which now only serves as an alibi for a strategy altogether free of influences and signs. Behind the baroqueness of images hides the eminence grise of politics. This way the stake will always have been the murderous power of images, murderers of the real, murderers of their own model, as the Byzantine icons could be those of divine identity. To this murderous power is opposed that of representations as a dialectical power, the visible and intelligible mediation of the real. All Western faith and good faith became engaged in this wager on representation, that a sign could refer to the depth of meaning, that a sign could be exchanged for meaning, and that that was something could, that could guarantee this exchange. God, of course. But what if God himself can be simulated, that is to say, can be reduced to the signs that constitute faith? Then the whole system becomes weightless. It is no longer itself anything but a giant simulacrum, not unreal, but a simulacrum, that is to say, never exchanged for the real, but exchanged for itself, in an uninterrupted circuit, without reference or circumference. Such is simulation in so far as it is opposed to representation. Representation stems from the principle of the equivalence of the sign and of the real. Even if this equivalence is utopian, it is a fundamental axiom. Simulation, on the contrary, stems from the utopia of the principle of equivalence, from the radical negation of the sign as value, from the sign as the reversion and death sentence of every reference. Whereas representation attempts to absorb simulation by interpreting it as a false representation, simulation envelops the whole edifice of representation itself as a simulacrum. Such would be the successive phases of the image. It is the reflection of a profound reality. It masks and denatures a profound reality. It masks the absence of a profound reality. It has no relation to reality whatsoever. It is its own pure simulacrum. In the first case, the image is a good appearance. Representation is of the sacramental order. In the second, is it, it is an evil appearance. It is of the order of malef mal malefeasance. Maleficence. In the third, it plays at being an appearance. It is, it is of the order of sorcery. In the fourth, it is no longer of the order of appearances, but of simulation. The transition from signs that dissimulate something to signs that dissimulate that there is nothing marks a decisive turning point. The first reflects a theology of truth and secrecy to which the notion of ideology still belongs. The second inaugurates the era of simulacra and of simulation, in which there is no longer a god to recognize his own, no longer a last judgment to separate the false from the true, the real from its artificial resurrection, as everything is already dead and resurrected in advance. When the real is no longer what it was, nostalgia assumes its full meaning. There is a plethora of myths of origin and of signs of reality, a plethora of truth, of secondary objectivity, and of authenticity. Escalation of the true, of lived experience, resurrection of the figurative where the object and substance have disappeared, 
panic-stricken production of the real and of the referential, parallel to and greater than the panic of material production. This is how simulation appears in the phase that concerns us, a strategy of the real, of the neo-real and the hyper-real, that everywhere is the double of a strategy of deterrence. Ramses, or the Rosy-Colored Resurrection Ethnology brushed up against its paradoxical death in 1971, the day when the Philippine government decided to return the few dozen Tassidae who had just been discovered in the depths of the jungle where they lived for eight centuries without contact with the rest of the species to their primitive state out of the re reach of colonizers, tourists, and ethnologists. This, at the suggestion of the anthropologists themselves, who were seeing the indigenous people disintegrate immediately upon contact, in order for ethnology to live, its object must die. By dying, the object takes its revenge for being discovered, and with its death defies the science that wants to grasp it. Doesn't all science live on this paradoxical slope to which it is doomed by the evanescence of its object in its very apprehension, and by the pitiless reversal of the dead object exerts on it? Like Orpheus, it always turns around too soon, and like Eurydice, its object falls back into Hades. It is against this hell of the paradox that the ethnologist wished to protect themselves by cordoning off the Tassidae with virgin forest. No one can touch them any more, as in a mine the vein is closed down. Science loses precious capital there, but the object will be safe, lost to science, but intact in its virginity. It is not a question of sacrifice. Science never sacrifices itself. It is always murderous but of the simulated sacrifice of its object in order to save its reality principle. The Tassidae, frozen in their natural element, will provide a perfect alibi, an eternal guarantee. Here begins an anti-ethnology that will never end, and to which Walline, Castaneda, Clastres are various witnesses. In any case, the logical evolution of a science is to distance itself increasingly from its object until it dispenses with it entirely. Its autonomy is only rendered even more fantastic. It attains pure form. The Indian, thus returned to the ghetto, in the glass coffin of the virgin forest, again becomes the model of simulation of all that possible Indians from before ethnology. This model thus grants itself the luxury to incarnate itself beyond itself. In the brute reality of these Indians, it is entirely reinvented. Quote, savages who are indebted to ethnology for still being savages. What a turn of events! What a triumph for this science that seemed to dedicate to their destruction! Of course, these persons are posthumous, frozen, cryogenicized, sterilized, protected to death. They have become referential sim sim simulacra, and science itself has become pure simulation. The same holds true at Crusoe at the level of the open museum, where once museumified in situ as historical witnesses of their period, entire working class neighborhoods, living metallurgic zones, an entire culture, men, women, and children included, gestures, languages, customs, fossilized alive as in a snapshot. The museum, instead of being circumscribed as a geometric site, is everywhere now like a dimension of life. Thus, ethnology, rather than circumscribing itself as an objective science, will today, liberated from its object, be applied to all living things, and make itself invisible, like an omnipresent fourth dimension, that of the sim sim simulacrum. We are all Tassides, Indians who have again become what they were, simulacral Indians who at last proclaim the universal truth of ethnology. We have all become living specimens, in the spectral light of ethnology, or of anti-ethnology, which is nothing but the pure form of triumphal ethnology under the sign of dead differences, and of the resurrection of differences. It is thus very naive to look for ethnology in some third world. It is here, everywhere, in the metropolises, in the white community, in a world completely catalogued and analyzed, then artificially resurrected under the auspices of the real, in a world of simulation, of the hallucination of truth, of the blackmail of the real, of the murder of every symbolic form and its hysterical, historical retrospection, a murder of which the savages, noblesse oblige, were the first victims, but that for, the long, for a long time has extended into Western societies. But in the same breath, ethnology grants us its only and final lesson, the secret that kills it, and which the 
savages knew better than it did the vengeance of the dead. The confinement of the scientific object is equal to the confinement of the mad and the dead. And just as all of society is irremediably contaminated by this mirror of madness that it has held up to itself, science can't help but die contaminated by the death of this object that is its inverse mirror. It is science that masters the objects, but it is the object that invests it with depth according to an unconscious reversion, which only gives a dead and circular response to a dead and circular interrogation. Nothing changes when society breaks the mirror of madness, abolishes the asylums, gives speech back to the insane, etc., nor when science seems to break the mirror of its objectivity, effacing itself before its object, as in Castaneda, etc., and to bend down before the differences. The form produced by confinement is followed by an innumerable, diffracted, slowed-down mechanism. As ethnology collapses in its classical institution, it survives in an anti-ethnology whose task it is to re-inject the difference fiction, the savagery fiction, everywhere, to conceal that it is this world, our world, which has again become savage in its way, that is to say, which is devastated by difference and by death. In the same way, with the pretext of saving the original, one forbade visitors to enter the Lascaux Caves, but an exact replica was constructed 500 meters from it, so that everyone could see them. One glances through a peephole at the authentic cave, and then one visits the reconstituted hole. It is possible that the memory of the original grottoes is itself stamped in the minds of future generations, but from now on there is no longer any difference. The duplication suffices to render both artificial. In the same way, science and technology were recently mobilized to save the mummy of Ramses II, after it was left to rot for several dozen years in the depths of a museum. The West is seized with panic at the thought of not being able to save what the symbolic order had been able to conserve for forty centuries, but out of sight and far from the light of day. Ramses does not signify anything for us, only the mummy is of an inestimable worth because it is what guarantees that accumulation has meaning. Our entire linear and accumulative cult culture collapses if we cannot stockpile the past in plain view. To this end, the pharaohs must be brought out of their tomb and the mummies out of their silence. To this end, they must be exhumed and given military honors. They are prey to both science and worms. Only absolute secrecy assured them this millennial power, the mastery over putrefaction that signified the mastery of the complete cycle of exchanges with death. We only know how to place our science in service of repairing the mummy, that is to say, restoring a visible order, whereas embalming was a mythical effort that strove to immortalize a hidden dimension. We require a visible past, a visible continuum, a visible myth of origin, which reassures us about our end because finally we have never believed in them. Whence this historic scene of the reception of the mummy at the Orly airport? Why? Because Ramses was a great despotic and military figure? Certainly. But mostly because our culture dreams behind this defunct power that it tries to annex of an order that would have nothing to do with it, and it dreams of it because it exterminated it by exhuming it as its own past. We are fascinated by Ramses as Renaissance Christians were by the American Indians, those human beings who had never known the word of Christ. Thus, at the beginning of colonization, there was a moment of stupor and bewilderment before the very possibility of escaping the universal law of the gospel. There were two possible responses, either admit that this law was not universal, or exterminate the Indians to efface the evidence. In general, one contented oneself with converting them, or even simply discovering them, which would suffice to slowly exterminate them. Thus, it would have been enough to exhume Ramses, to ensure his extermination by museumification. Because mummies don't rot from worms, they die from being transplanted from a slow order of the symbolic, master over putrefaction and death, to an order of history, science, and museums, our order, which no longer masters anything, which only knows how to condemn what preceded it to death and decay, and subsequently to try to revive it with science. Irreparable violence towards all secrets, the violence of a civilization without secrets, hatred of a whole civilization just for its own foundation. And just as with ethnology, which plays at extricating itself from its object to better secure itself in its pure form, demuseumification is nothing but another spiral in artificiality. Witness the cloister at Saint-Michel de Cuxa 
which one will repatriate at great cost from the cloisters in New York to reinstall it in its original site, and everyone is supposed to applaud this restitution, as they did the experimental campaign to take back the sidewalks on the Champs-Élysées. Well, if the exportation of the cornices was in effect an arbitrary act, if the cloisters in New York are an artificial mosaic of all cultures, following a logic of the capitalist centralization of value, the re-importation to the original site is even more artificial. It is a total simulacrum that links up with reality through a complete circumvolution. The cloister should have stayed in New York in its simulated environment, which at least fooled no one. Repatriating it is nothing but a supplementary subterfuge, acting as if nothing had happened and indulging in retrospective hallucination. In the same way, Americans flatter themselves for having brought back the population of Indians back to pre-conquest levels. One effaces everything and starts over. They even flatter themselves for doing better, for exceeding the original number. This is presented as proof of the superiority of civilization. It will produce more Indians than they themselves were able to do. With sinister derision, this overproduction is again a means of destroying them, for all tribal culture rests in the limitation of the group and the refusal of any unlimited increase, as can be seen in Ishii's case. In this way, their demographic promotion is just another step towards symbolic extermination. Everywhere we live in a universe strangely similar to the original, things are doubled by their own scenario, but this doubling does not signify, as it did traditionally, the imminence of their death. They were already purged of their death and better than when they were alive, more cheerful, more authentic in the light of their model, like the faces in funeral homes. Right. Disneyland is the perfect model of all the entangled orders of sim simulacra, the hyperreal and the imaginary. It is first of all a play of illusions and phantasms, the pirates, the frontier, the future world, etc. This imaginary world is supposed to ensure the success of the operation, but what attracts the crowds the most is without a doubt the social microcosm, the religious, miniaturized pleasure of real America, its constraints and joys. One parks outside and stands in line outside. One is altogether abandoned at the exit. The only phantasmagoria in this imaginary world lies in the tenderness and warmth of the crowd and in the sufficient and excessive number of gadgets necessary to create the multitudinous effect. The contrast with the absolute solitude of the parking lot, a veritable concentration camp, is, tota is total. Or rather, inside, a whole panoply of gadgets magnetizes the crowd in directed flows. Outside, solitude is directed at a single gadget, the automobile. By an extraordinary coincidence, but this drives without a doubt from the enchantment inherent to the, this universe, this frozen childlike world is found to have been conceived and realized by a man who is himself now cryogenicized, Walt Disney, who awaits his resurrection through an increase of 180 degrees centigrade. Thus, everywhere in Disneyland, the objective profile of America, down to the morphology of individuals and of the crowd, is drawn. All its values are exalted by the miniature and the comic, embalmed and pacified. Whence the possibility of the ideological analysis of Disneyland, Al Marin did it very well in Utopique Jeu d'Espace, Utopia's Play of Space, digest of the American way of life, panegyric of American values, idealized transposition of a contradictory reality, certainly. But this masks something else, and this ideological blanket functions as a cover for a simulation of the third order. Disneyland exists in order to hide that it is the real country, all of real America, that is Disneyland, a bit like prisons are there to hide that it is the social in its entirety, in its banal omnipresence, that is carceral. Disneyland is presented as imaginary in order to make us believe that the rest is real, whereas all of Los Angeles and the America that surrounds it are not real, but belong to the hyperreal order and to the order of simulation. It is no longer a question of the false representation of reality, ideology, but of concealing the fact that the real is no longer real, and thus of saving the reality principle. The imaginary of Disneyland is neither true nor false. It is a deterrence machine set up in order to rejuvenate the fiction of the real in the opposite camp. Whence the debility of this imaginary its infantile degeneration. The world wants to be childish in order to make us believe that the adults are elsewhere, in the real world, and to conceal the fact that true childish, childishness is everywhere, 
that it, that it is that of the adults themselves who come here to act the child in order to foster illusions as to their real childishness. Childishlessness. Disneyland is not the only one, however. Enchanted Village, Magic Mountain, Marine World. Los Angeles is surrounded by these imaginary stations that feed reality, the energy of the real, to a city whose mystery is precisely that of no longer being anything but a network of incessant, unreal circulation, a city of incredible proportions but without space, without dimension. As much as electrical and atomic power stations, as much as cinema studios, this city, which is no longer anything but an immense scenario and a perpetual pan shot, needs this old imaginary like a sympathetic nervous system made up of childhood signals and faked phantasms. Disneyland, a space of the regeneration of the imaginary as waste treatment plants are elsewhere and even here. Everywhere today one must recycle waste, and the dreams, the phantasms, the historical, fairy-like, legendary imaginary of children and adults is a waste product the first great toxic excrement, excrement of a hyperreal civilization. On a mental level, Disneyland is the prototype of this new function, but all the sexual, psychic, somatic recycling institutes, which proliferate in California, belong to the same order. People no longer look at each other, but there are institutes for that. They no longer touch each other, but there is contactotherapy. They no longer walk, but they go jogging, etc. Everywhere one recycles lost faculties, or lost bodies, or lost sociality, or the lost taste for food. One reinvents penury, asceticism, vanished savage naturalness, natural food, health food, yoga, Marshall Salem's idea that it is the economy of the market and not of nature at all that secretes penury is verified, but at a secondary level. Here, in the sophisticated confines of a triumphal market economy, is reinvented a penury slash sign, a penury slash simulacrum, a simulated behavior of the underdeveloped, including that adoption of Marxist tenets, that, in the guise of ecology, of energy crises and the critique of capital, finds its final esoteric areoli to the triumph of an esoteric culture. Nevertheless, maybe a mental catastrophe, a mental implosion, an involution without the precedent lies in wait for a system of this kind, whose visible signs could be those of this strange obesity or the incredible coexistence of the most bizarre theories and practices, which correspond to the improbable coalition of luxury, heaven, and money, to the improbable luxurious materialization of life, and to undiscoverable contradictions.